CG, the uh, Centre for International Governance Innovation, is the Canadian independent, nonpartisan, not for profit think tank. And our research programs focus on the governance of the global economy, global security and politics, and international law. And we strive to bring clarity and innovative thinking to the uh, global policy making through our re the research that we do here and through our fellows uh, pretty much every, um, everywhere all over the world, through the opinions that we take and uh, by having a public voice. So if you haven't done so already, I do encourage you to visit our stand, which was uh, out here. Uh, take a look and uh, take with you home some of our publications and visit our website at cgonline.org where you can get all of our, our materials uh, for free as well. So again, welcome to our home and thank you for coming here tonight to listen to an interesting presentation by Jeff Rubin, the senior fellow uh, here at CG, which will be followed by an exchange between Jeff, uh, Bill Mernigan, the director of research at Unifor, and which will be moderated by Kevin Carmichael, another CG fellow. And I may just uh, uh, step in here and there. So the NAFTA, the reason that brings us here, has been described as a great success on the one hand, but albeit more recently, it has also been described as the worst agreement ever. Now, <clears throat> uh, on the success side, trade and investment flows between the three NAFTA parties have increased enormously. I thought about using the words tremendous or tremendously, but I think that they have been uh, a little bit abused of late. But it is true that uh, uh, trade, trilateral trade between the three NAFTA parties has increased uh, enormously since the NAFTA went into force in 1994. Uh, the, the, the increase has been over 300%. And today, trilateral trade is, exceeds $1 trillion a year. And that has been the case for several years already. Now, as I stated in a paper that I wrote uh, for CG back in 2015 on account of the 20th anniversary of the NAFTA, um, <clears throat> and I quote, even though an obvious benefit for all three countries, this is all three NAFTA countries, so even though a benefit for all three countries was the increase in regional trade and investment flows, an analysis at that level alone would be incomplete. And I close here the quote. So a statistical analysis of the NAFTA is not enough. That would be incomplete. Now, I would not agree that the NAFTA is a bad deal or that it has been a bad deal for any of the three NAFTA countries, but it is true that there have been costs, adjustment costs, and that some industries have fared uh, better than others. And tonight, we have the privilege at CEG to have Jeff Rubin speak to us uh, to one of those sectors. Jeff is a senior fellow at CEG. He is a Canadian economist, a world leading ex expert on energy, he began his career here in Ontario at the Ministry of Treasury and Economics. He served for two decades at CIBC uh, World Markets, where he was the Chief Economist and Managing Director at the Investment Bank, and where he was formerly the Chief Economist and Chief Strategist. Jeff is also a best-selling author. His book, his first book, Why Your World is About to Get a, Lo a Whole Lot Smaller, was an international bestseller. And he has since written two other books. So again, if you haven't had the chance to do so, you will please go uh, uh, on your way out and take a look. We have a stand there. His books are there. And uh, we do encourage to take one or maybe two of them uh, home with you. Jeff is currently researching the implications of shifting U.S. trade, energy, and environmental policies um, on the Canadian economy under the Trump administration. 
and he is doing uh, an assessment of how Canada's auto industry has performed relative to its NAFTA trading partners. And that this has been characterized as a thorny issue. As a Mexican national and a former NAFTA negotiator myself, I would not characterize it as a thorny issue, but it is certainly complex. So uh, please help me in welcome Jeff uh, to the stage so that we can all learn a little bit more about it uh, tonight. Thank you, Jeff. President Donald Trump, the master deal maker, has vilified NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and vilified the companies that have moved their production to Mexico for stealing American jobs. The car business is being abused more than most other businesses, right? And a lot of the business comes from overseas, and a lot of the business that you have is now moving to Mexico. I want those cars made in Michigan. I want those cars made here, right? Right? Bringing back jobs is a familiar call for elections all around the world. But the data shows that President Trump may actually be right, that Americans, and Canadians as well, have lost their jobs to Mexico. NAFTA was supposed to be good for all three economies. So why the fading imprint of the auto and parts industry in Canada? Canada and the U.S. have long had a relatively balanced trading relationship in this industry, well before NAFTA. In fact, going back to the Auto Pact, a bilateral free trade automotive agreement signed way back in 1965. Canada and the United States trade more with each other than any other two countries. Indeed, about one-fifth of your exports go to Canada. And automobiles and parts constitute the largest single category in that trade. When NAFTA first went into force in 1994, Mexico's workforce was seen as subpar and unlikely to compete for the highly skilled tasks required in auto parts manufacturing. This is NAFTA at work. Expensive Canadian technology, a big U.S. parent, and cheap Mexican labor. But what happens when Mexican manufacturers' productivity catches up? The Canadian Auto Workers Union says that's when the Mexican option becomes a threat to Canadian workers. And that's exactly what has happened over the last 25 years. Thanks to automation, and investment in new facilities, the Mexican workforce has caught up, but their wage rates haven't, providing attractive profit margins for those companies who locate there. At the beginning, we were just doing assembly. Now we do assembly and machining of components. Uh, we do some very complex components here that seven years ago, we thought we would never relocalize in, in, in Mexico. And we're now seeing the impact. Canadian Vehicle Assembly peaked in 1999 with 3 million vehicles built in that year. Today, Canada produces around 2.3 million units, roughly the same number it did when NAFTA first came into effect. Since the recession, the industry has closed a number of Canadian plants, despite huge taxpayer-funded bailouts paid to General Motors and Chrysler to maintain their Canadian operations. Meanwhile, vehicle production in Mexico has more than tripled under NAFTA. By 2008, Mexico surpassed Canada in total vehicle assembly and now produces 50% more vehicles than Canada. Before NAFTA, Mexican vehicle production accounted for 7% of the North American market. It now accounts for over 20% of that market and is expected to climb even higher. While Canada still produces marginally more vehicles than are sold in the country, Mexico, on the other hand, has become an export platform where over 70% of the vehicles made in the country are sold in the United States. As a result, America's trade deficit with Mexico in vehicles and parts has soared and is over three times the size of America's sectoral trade deficit with Canada. We want to build, create, and grow more products in our country using American labor, American goods, and American grit. No longer are we going to allow other countries to break the rules, steal our jobs, and drain our wealth. And it has been drained. It has been drained. 
Technically, Mexico hasn't done anything wrong, and neither have the companies like Canadian firm Magna that have moved their production there. After all, they're only maximizing profits by using much lower cost Mexican labor, which NAFTA both permits and indeed encourages them to do so. But President Trump calls that an unfair trade deal and vows to renegotiate it. If President Trump's goal is to see the return of domestic manufacturing and balance trade between America and its trading partners, then it's Canada who is far more likely to meet those requirements than Mexico. Labor costs in Canada and the U.S. are basically comparable in comparison to Mexico's wage rates that are less than a fifth those found north of the border. Similarly, trade between Canada and the U.S. is relatively balanced compared to the large and growing deficit the U.S. runs with Mexico. While the Canadian government has said early on that it would seek a common front with Mexico in renegotiating NAFTA, when it comes to the auto industry, Canadian and Mexican interests are not really aligned. Canada should carefully consider a separate bilateral trade agreement with the U.S. that ensures the continuation of duty-free trade between the two nations in the sector and enhances the competitiveness of Canadian plants and jobs. Otherwise, a continuation of the status quo under NAFTA will bring an inevitable downsizing of the Canadian industry and a further loss of middle-income jobs. American calls for rene renegotiating NAFTA come at a time of a rapidly changing environment for global trade. Amidst mounting concerns throughout OECD countries about the loss of middle class jobs, wage stagnation, and falling incomes. Global trade is now growing at the slowest pace it has since the recession. In part, that's a reflection of much slower global economic growth. But ebbing trade flows also reflect the increased frequency of restrictive trade practices among the G20 economies, the world's largest economies. And of course, as most Canadians recognize, those restrictive trade measures are alive and well in 2017. So what's going on? Is there a, a bigger story at play here? After decades of ever greater globalization spurred by successive rounds of multilateral and bilateral trade liberalization, the policy pendulum around the world seems to be at a minimum halting and perhaps is at a point of inflection. Public support and countries that have always been at the forefront of championing free trade, like the United States and the United Kingdom, has tilted, tilted not only against endorsing new trade agreements, but in favor of exiting existing ones. Donald Trump's admittedly stunning electoral victory, largely on a campaign to bring back lost manufacturing jobs, follows on the heels of Britain's equally stunning decision, uh, the Brexit decision to leave the European Union. Both, I think, are red flags, red flags that are cautioning us and challenging traditional wisdom that further free trade deals are not only beneficial, but ultimately, and most importantly, inevitable. What's particularly striking, I think, today about the growing opposition to free trade deals and further globalization is really how it's gained support across the political spectrum. Let's not forget that had Bernie Sanders won the Democratic ticket and beaten Donald Trump in the election, as many believed he would, we'd still be having this discussion tonight because Bernie Sanders also thought that free trade agreements were unfair to the interests of American workers. He also believed that the U.S. should pull out of the Trans-Pacific 
partnership agreement, which Trump immediately did, and he also called for a renegotiation of NAFTA. It's interesting to note that in the Brexit decision, there was political support for Brexit across political lines in both the Conservative and Labour Party. And in the French election, the far-right candidate, Marine Le Pen, and the far-left candidate, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, both argued for France to follow Britain and leave the European Union. In this case, it was the movement of uh, Whirlpool dryer factory jobs from northern France to Poland that was the lightning rod, as in the U.S. case it was Ford's announced intention to build an assembly plant in Mexico. Well, I think it's fair to say then that, that something's going on here bigger than just the whims of some rogue politician in the United States who nobody expected to ever get elected. It certainly goes against what economists have been telling us, because ever since the days of David Ricardo in the 19th century, when he espoused his theory of comparative advantage, it's pretty well been accepted by most economists, certainly mainstream economists, that there are net welfare gains from free trade, meaning that in theory, everybody can be made better off. Yet the empirical evidence of the last couple of decades is the exact opposite, that the gains from free trade are going to a narrow and narrower percentage of our population, and that many people are getting left behind. Not only left behind, but today are worse off than in the past. Those most left behind are industrial workers in OECD countries, many of whom have lost their jobs to imports from low-wage economies that now have duty-free access to their markets. In the 1970s, over three-quarters of world manufacturing output would have been made by G7 countries, today less than 50%. And even those that have retained their job have done so at the expense of wage concessions fearing that any increase in their wages would spur the movement of their jobs to low-wage trading partners. For Canada, next to Germany, the most trade-dependent of all the G7 economies, with roughly 30% of GDP, this raises particularly vexing issues. Successive Conservative and liberal governments have argued that we need to find new free trade agreements, that free trade agreements are indeed the route to creating new middle-class jobs. Yet the empirical evidence and record suggests the exact opposite, that in the last 20 years of free trade and globalization, what we've seen is a hollowing out of Canada's industrial sector. While the economy is producing jobs and unemployment rates are nearing cyclical lows, the quality of those jobs has steadily diminished. There hasn't been any job creation in the good sector of our economy, the sector of our economy that's the most vulnerable and exposed to import competition for over 17 years. All of the job creation in our economy has been in services. Yet, during those 17 years, there haven't been any real wage gains in the service sector. So, those kind of trends go a long way in explaining why 50% of Canadian households have really seen negligible real income gains since NAFTA first came into effect in 1994. It's in that context that we need to understand the current NAFTA negotiations and in particular how they impact the auto sector, which is still Canada's largest manufacturing industry and still Canada's largest export sector. As many of you, most of you know, President Trump has specifically targeted the vehicle and parts industry as a prime example of why NAFTA isn't working for American workers. 
you know, in many respects, what's happening in North America's vehicle and parts industry are a microcosm of what's happening to manufacturing sectors across the OECD in the last 20, 25 years. In broad brush terms, what NAFTA allowed to happen in the vehicle and parts industry is that we traded domestic production and employment to Mexico in exchange for higher profit margins for vehicle producers and lower vehicle prices for North American consumers. President Trump has pledged to change that basic economic equation and repatriate jobs lost in that sector and redefine uh, the once large footprint that that industry had in the U.S. economy through, if necessary, resurrecting trade restrictions that once protected the U.S. market. What he's been particularly critical of is the mass migration of employment and production to Mexico, where wages are a fifth to an eighth of what they are in the US. While cross-border value-added chains are said to blur distinctions of where vehicles are actually made, a whole host of industry metrics, employment, production, investment, and trade balances, all point to a massive migration of the industry from both Canada and the US to low-wage Mexico. Are President Trump's noted criticisms of NAFTA's shortcomings for American workers valid for Canadian workers as well? Well, as it turns out, they may even be more valid for Canadian workers than they are for American workers. By most industry metrics, employment, production, trade balance, investment, Canada's been as adversely affected, and in some cases more adversely affected than the U.S. industry by the massive movement of production to Mexico. The vehicle and parts industry in Canada has been the largest trading partner of the U.S., as is the U.S. vehicle and parts industry the largest trading partner to Canada. The paramount importance of this sector to Canada-U.S. trade long, long predates NAFTA. It goes back to 1965 when we implemented the Canadian-U.S. Auto Pact. The Canadian-U.S. Auto Pact allowed for duty-free trade, although it would hardly be considered a free trade agreement. It was really a managed trade agreement. What it allowed American car producers, it allowed American car producers to gain duty access to the Canadian market in exchange for production in Canada that was at least equivalent to their sales in Canada. And the most economically efficient way of organizing around that was to award Canadian plants North American product mandates. So they, they would be producing vehicles not just for Canada, but for Canada and the United States, and hence able to achieve scale economies that would otherwise be unobtainable in the small and highly fragmented domestic market. For decades, the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, uh, Auto Pact, provided the kind of balanced reciprocal trade that the Trump administration is looking for. Canada typically recorded surpluses in assembled cars and ran deficits with the US on component parts. The important structural sense, the overall trade balances between Canada and the US under the Auto Pact and later under the Free Trade Agreement, were largely self-contained for structural reasons. And that's because the more vehicles Canada produced and exported to the United States, the more it imported components from the United States to build those vehicles. 
So increases in the trade balance with the United States on finished vehicles would be associated with increasing deficits with the United States on imported components. And indeed, if we look at the trade surplus in auto and parts today with the United States, it's about 13 billion. It's no more than it was with the United States when NAFTA first went into effect in 1994. That's starkly different, of course, with the trade balances with Mexico. The U.S. trade balance with Mexico in auto and parts, fulfilling the warnings of Ross Perot back in 1994, have increased five-fold. Similarly, the trade deficit between Canada and Mexico in vehicle and parts have also increased five-fold since 1994. Some economists say that trade surpluses don't matter and that we're misguided in looking at them. Well, I suppose trade surpluses don't matter if production and employment also don't matter. But if production and employment do matter, then trade surpluses are a pretty good leading indicator of what's happened to production and employment. So let's just look at how those two aspects of the industry have fared in Canada since 1994. Prior to NAFTA, Canada was the fourth largest auto manufacturer in the world, which was quite a remarkable feature considering the size of our domestic market and certainly a testament to the success of originally the Auto Pact and later on the Free Trade Agreement. However, since then, Canada is no longer even in the top ten. Canada today produces no more vehicles than it did in 1994, despite a spectacular increase in North American vehicle sales after the recession spurred by record low interest rates. By 2008, Mexico had surpassed Canada in production. Mexican production has over tripled since 1994 and is now about 50% higher than Canada. Canada's a little bit over 2 million, Mexico's about 3.5 million vehicles. It was forecast under the status quo NAFTA, now, that may change, but under the status quo NAFTA, Canada was scheduled to lose about another half a million units over the next five to seven years, while Mexican production was going to increase from about 3.5 million to 5 million. As a share of North American vehicle sales, Canada has fallen from around 18% to less than 13%, its lowest level since the 1980s. Mexico's share has more than tripled from 7% to over 21%. So, what's the big attraction with Mexico? Well, if you're wondering what the big attraction is with Mexico, you just have to look at its wage rates and everything becomes clearly in focus. Mexico now provides wage rates that are among the cheapest anywhere in the world in the auto and parts sector. Hourly wages in the huge parts industry in Mexico is about $2.45 an hour. Hourly wages in the assembly industry are about $5 an hour in Mexico. That's about one-fifth to one-tenth what comparable wages would be in Michigan or Ontario. Now, I, I should point out that those wage rates that are a fraction of Canada's wage rates are about double the average manufacturing wage in Mexico. And what we're really looking at is two very, very different labor markets. In Mexico, something like 13% of the labor force is still in agriculture. In Canada and the United States, it's about 1% or 2%. And hence, that poses very different sets of challenges than under the Auto Pact or the Free Trade Agreement. Canada, U.S. wage rates in the auto and parts industry is basically the same save for, at most, the exchange rate. And the Canada-U.S. exchange rate fluctuates within a very narrow range of, say, between 70 and 90 cents 
about 90% of the time. Here we're talking about integrating a labor market that is fundamentally different. So, not surprisingly, we've seen a massive movement of employment. Just to gain some focus on how employment has shifted, 2007, Mexico and Canada had roughly the same employment levels in the auto and parts industry. They were both about 170,000. Since then, Mexico's employment has increased to about 900,000. Canada, like the U.S., has lost about 25% of its labor force. The industry claims that job losses in Canada and the United States is due mainly to increased automation and the increased mechanization of production. But do such claims really explain the massive diversion of employment between the United States, Canada, and Mexico in this industry? Or are there, is there some other larger force at play? There's no question that today's auto plant has a smaller employment footprint than yesterday's auto plant. But robots notwithstanding, when Ford canceled its scheduled auto assembly plant in the Mexican state of San Luis Potosi at President Trump's urging, that plant would have employed 3,000 workers. And around that plant would have been clustered a whole plethora of parts companies with thousands more uh, working jobs being created. Let's not kid ourselves. The location of investment is still a very prime driver of employment. And what we've seen is the last eight assembly plants in North America have all gone to Mexico and with them triggering a cluster of supply of uh, parts producers. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, while the automation argument is valid within its own terms, it obfuscates what is an even more important fundamental shift in investment, which explains the huge divergence in employment trends of the industry in Canada and the U.S. on one hand, and in Mexico on the other hand. So, Against this backdrop, what can we expect from the current NAFTA negotiations? We heard from the U.S. side a lot of talk about raising minimum content regulations. The way that NAFTA works is that goods in the auto industry can only cross each other's borders tariff-free if they meet 62.5% North American content. That means that 62.5% of the value added in the car has to have been created in Mexico, the United States, and Canada. The U.S. has argued that they want to raise the threshold to 75%. That's not going to fundamentally change much. First of all, because to meet the 75% or the increased North American content percentage, it's more, more likely that production would just continue to bulk up in Mexico, not in Mexico, not in Canada or in the United States. The U.S. have bandied about the idea of, in addition to 75% North American content, that there be an explicit 25% U.S. content. But again, that measure doesn't really have any teeth, because if companies don't comply with that, they pay the tariff rate instead, and the most favored nation tariff rate against Mexican vehicles and parts is 2.5% in the United States, hardly a disincentive for compliance. You know, so what ultimately is going to occur is up for grabs. You know, what the U.S. trade delegation is arguing and what the White House wants may be two different things. During the campaign, Donald Trump floated the idea of a 35% tariff against autos and parts uh, coming from Mexico. That certainly would be a game changer. That certainly would have a huge impact, for example, on something that's going on right around the corner from here. 
and that's the GM a plant in Ingersoll, which Unifor is now on strike for because GM is threatening to move the production of its Equinox vehicle to Mexico, where it faces much, much lower wage rates. All of a sudden, if Trump were to go ahead and impose those kind of tariffs, I think that GM would quickly decide to keep those jobs in Mexico, to keep those jobs here in southern Ontario. But we haven't really seen America show its hand yet in the trade negotiations. Um, but I think that what we're looking at is, is basically to somehow equalize the wage gap. And that's a very, very difficult thing when you're looking at fundamentally different labor markets as you are with Mexico uh, versus Canada. What would happen if the unthinkable happens and in fact the U.S. terminates or abrogates NAFTA? Uh, technically, we would revert back to the free trade agreement uh, which preceded NAFTA, which had duty-free movement of autos and parts between the two countries. Uh, technically, Mexico would refer back to its most favored nation status with the United States. Of course, at that time, the U.S. administration could be free to impose any tariff that it wishes against Mexico's parts, like it's imposed, for example, tariffs against Canadian softwood lumber. Preserving the status quo under NAFTA right now um, would basically mean that our industry will continue to face a gradual downsizing. And I think that that's clear from what's already happened and that's clear from corporate intentions. In closing, I want to emphasize that I, I, I don't want to villainize auto companies from moving to Mexico. If I was a shareholder in Magna, if I was a shareholder in GM, that's exactly what I would want those companies to do. Because obviously when you pay $2.50 to 5 cents an hour in wage costs versus 30 to $40 an hour in wage costs, caterus paribus, everything else being equal, you're gonna have prior, higher profit margins. And this is an industry that only 10 years ago was in partial bankruptcy and required taxpayer bailouts in both Canada and the United States. So people want to see a healthy industry. What I'm suggesting, however, is that trade policy can't simply be focused on the interests of shareholders in Magna and GM. That those interests come at a cost not only to the Canadian worker, but to the Canadian economy in terms of the declining footprint of what was once our largest and greatest industry. And that is equally for the, for the U.S. So balancing those competing interests is not just the challenge for the auto sector, but really for our whole economy. But starting with what is still Canada's largest manufacturing sector, what we need is either a voluntary production agreement like we had with the auto pact or new trade measures to bring that essential balance back. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. We'll uh, hear from uh, some more from you in a moment. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm not going to belabor the introductions. If you want to know more about any of us, you can Google our names uh, now or later. My name is Kevin Carmichael. I'm a senior fellow here at CG. I write for McLean's on a fairly regular basis. Um, and I'm going to call to the stage very soon uh, Bill Murningham, Research Director from Unifor. As Bill makes his way up, I'm just going to remind everyone that uh, if you would like to, uh, to tweet anything throughout uh, this evening's um, presentation, the hashtag is CGLive. We encourage debate and controversy, so if you want to whip some people up uh, on social media this evening, please feel free. Um, I'll do my part in trying to whip up some controversy a bit later, but uh, for now, here's uh, Bill Murningham.
Great. Thank, thank you very much for everyone for being here, and thanks for the kind introduction, and uh, obviously to Jeff and uh, to CG, Hugo, Heather, and her team who've looked after this event so well on this incredibly essential issue and important debate. I, uh, I, I think this is a, an incredible, a tremendous, uh, excellent, a huge contribution to the discussion. Okay, I got one laugh on my Trump joke. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, I'm pleased that Unifor could join with CG on this event to partner in co-sponsoring uh, the event. For those who don't know, Unifor is Canada's largest union in the private sector. We have about 310,000 members in pretty well every sector of the economy, <coughs> including 40,000 members in the auto assembly and parts sector. And uh, of course, trade has been a cornerstone not only of the industry, as you heard so eloquently from Jeff, uh, tracing some of that history uh, just a few moments ago, but it's this essential work for our union as well. The industry is so important to our overall economy. I think people forget about that and what it means and what it delivers largest export sector, over 130,000 jobs, and the spin-off benefits are so strong, somewhere in the range of nine jobs to one in the auto assembly sector, it's little wonder that everyone wants one, and it's little wonder that governments around the world use trade policy to try and capture it. So the central question in front of us all in these NAFTA discussions and here is what uh, is the balance in an open, mid-sized economy like Canada for industrial and trade policy to secure the future of our auto and advanced manufacturing. There's nothing automatic in Canada about us having any manufacturing necessarily. We are neither the large, rich market. Uh, we're not the home base, uh, branch plant economy historically, and nor do we have the cheap labor. So again, incredible challenges for us, and trade is a key point uh, and policy lever for it. Um, first, again, a few comments on Jeff's paper. I'm not here to debate uh, it, rather offer a few comments from the perspective of Unifor. Um, again, uh, an excellent contribution and a timely assessment. An awful lot of opinions, an awful lot of rhetoric happening today around trade and NAFTA. Opinions are good. I'm a firm believer that informed opinions are even better. Um, and so having uh, Jeff's paper in front of all of us is incredibly helpful. Uh, as you heard tonight, his assessment of the history of trade policy and a real careful look at some of the key metrics is really what counts uh, on trade balance uh, and our deficits. He explained that as well. Uh, and the shift of production, and I think this is a point I would emphasize as well in my remarks. Um, you know, it's hard to quite square that perhaps it's automation or something that has driven jobs out of Canada. There are four million more vehicles being made in North America today than when NAFTA was signed. Two-thirds of that production went to Mexico, a third to the States, and as was pointed out, Canada has none of it. You know, again, in terms of the jobs, Mexico has almost half of North America's jobs, but only 8% of the market. And that's an important thing to consider when we think about the history of the auto pact that tied benefits in relation to the size of the market. Um, you know, uh, in short, I would agree with Jeff's assessment and, uh, and largely that automakers have responded to the conditions that have been set for them. And at a certain point, no matter how frustrated we get with them, um, of course, that's what they're going to do. But that has meant a decline for our industry uh, and it's accelerating as we speak. So again, I don't want to retrace some of the points that Jeff has made in my uh, short few minutes here, but rather is to offer some different points of uh, um, perspective and, and perhaps some provocations and hopefully add to our discussions here. Uh, it was mentioned as well, the first thing I'd like to talk about, I have three things, is the uh, strike currently ongoing just down the road about 45 minutes from here at a General Motors plant in Ingersoll. They are now heading into their third week of strike and is their first strike in 26 years. It's been said, and I'll say it again, that what's happening there is the poster child for what's wrong with NAFTA. They have had the highest quality, highest production. They've been working overtime for years, uh, winning every award. And when we think about it, we can think about this town that's 45 minutes down the road from here and another town that's 45 hours down the road from here. And that would be the town by the name of San Luis Potosi in central Mexico. Earlier this year, General Motors moved one vehicle uh, to uh, that plant. It would cost 600 jobs just down the road. And then they've added huge capacity to continue building more vehicles uh, that are currently built in Ingersoll in Mexico. 
And our members now are on the street, they're seeing the writing on the wall, and they're insisting that they get some job security in the prospect. So again, uh, why would GM move? What is behind all this? And I think we've touched on that already. The cheapest auto workers in the planet by the assessments I read. And again, I think Jeff and I, we can argue a little bit about the, the uh, debate, uh, the wage rates. Um, I've seen some more recent research that talks about production workers pay at about two and a half dollars an hour. Uh, and the key conclusion is that it's actually going down and not up. Um, you know, uh, the most recent research that I've seen uh, shows that the General Motors plant in San Luis Potosi is actually at the bottom of the pay levels in Mexico. Um, and the, like the industry in North America, has been increasingly moving to uh, less expensive locations uh, within the country. Uh, San Luis Potosi uh, is, again, one of the poorer regions of Mexico. Uh, according to the OECD, ranks 23rd out of 32 states, and the average household income is about $5,600 per year, household income. To consider Henry Ford's metrics about people being able to afford what they build, gross wages in Canada, you'd buy the Equinox in about five and a half months. In Mexico, it would take eight years. I think one of the most fundamental uh, facts about assessing uh, where we're going in NAFTA talks is about uh, wages and wages going down in Mexico. There was a great uh, Canadian government study from the early 1990s considering free trade with Mexico, and they thought uh, and predicted that wages in Mexico would uh, level up to around Canadian levels and over time. Now, being good uh, researchers, they didn't specify what time meant, but 23 years later, the fact is that wages are not going up. Uh, the minimum wage in Mexico is 65 cents. Wages are down in auto, and Moody's, not just the some left-wing union guy, but Moody's reported last week that the overall uh, mass of wages is lower today in Mexico than it was in NAFTA, accounting for inflation. Uh, why is this happening? Let me give you a quick example of, of how that unfolds. Uh, in the same town of San Luis Potosi, uh, BMW is opening a new plant. It's set to come online sometime next year. About two years before uh, the production was to start, where they're going to build $60,000 vehicles for North America, they signed an agreement with what some people might call a union. We've been calling them government-controlled and largely corrupt unions. And they signed a new agreement for starting pay of $1 per hour. Um, who is this union? Well, this is something, a group called the CTM, which is the, uh, the Workers' Federation. Uh, that has been controlling labor in Mexico since the 1930s as an arm largely of the government, uh, governing party, the PRI, for many, many years. Most workers in Mexico never vote. They never see their agreement. And to be frank, most assessments don't even, when you ask them, they don't even know that there is a union in the workplace. I was in Mexico City in NAFTA talks just in the early uh, part of uh, September, along with the president of our union, Jerry Diaz, who you may have seen uh, speaking in the media during that period of time. Uh, <coughs> and among the many things that we did at that point was to meet with some of the independent unions in Mexico. By and large, the assessment is that 90% of unionized workers belong to unions that are not truly unions, and about 10% are. And I'd like to just tell you a story about being on the stage in a room about this size in Mexico City at the hall of a union called Los Mineros, which is the mine workers union. And they have been an independent union uh, for 40, 50 years uh, and have been hounded uh, under threat. Um, and we had uh, our president speaking on the stage about how workers in Mexico should have the power to raise their standards. The workers in Mexico are not building low end. They're building some of the most advanced technology in the world, uh, valuable resources. Um, and they should have the power if they were not being held under by laws that keep them from independently negotiating. And while Jerry Diaz, our president, is speaking on the podium, on the screen behind him, uh, is the president of the union. And he's being Skyped into the meeting because he's been living in Canada in exile for 10 years, afraid for his life upon return to Mexico. And uh, an incredibly poignant scene uh, to understand what some of the challenges are in terms of labor and raising wages in Mexico. So I think at its heart, a close look at the Ingersoll strike explains an awful lot of what is wrong with NAFTA and auto trade and what we're up against. 
Uh, and also, that brings me very quickly to uh, the second point I'd like to make, uh, which is about policy options. I'll see that I'm going along here, so I'm going to move very quickly and offer my two second comments, uh, two other comments very quickly. The first one is about Canada uh, needing to overcome our Boy Scout view of trade. Uh, we have a real reputation on that, where we like to play by the rules and believe in fairness. And by and large, we remain naive to how global decisions are made in the process, what influence of active policy uh, and the legitimate power of government can make in shaping the economy. Uh, this Boy Scout approach is seen not only in our NAFTA talks, uh, whether or not the Boeing dispute about Bombardier or softwood labor as well. Uh, Canada needs to consider that there are very strong mechanisms available to governments elsewhere. And I'll just point out a simple fact about tariffs, autos, uh, trade in autos uh, coming into the EU face about a 10% tariff. China, the largest market in the world, has a 47% tariff and requirements that the government owns half the company. And I could go on. Canada is very much a one-way street in terms of our regional trading relationships in, in NAFTA. Uh, and governments elsewhere put in place strong rules to not only protect the industry, but to foster innovation and build the industry, and we should consider some of those rules. The third and final point I'd like to just offer for our thought here is that we really do need to see beyond some of the politics of the moment that we're facing, and again, uh, Jeff started out very eloquently talking about our friend uh, Donald Trump, um, and he and other right-wing populists have very much seized the agenda uh, about the issue of job loss, the hollowing out of manufacturing, uh, and the U.S. Rust Belt clearly delivered his win. I think it's a mistake for us to get caught in this false choice somehow of being pro-Trump uh, if we're opposing certain kinds of trade. Trump versus globalization is a really weak and uh, largely a straw man kind of argument, and we get narrowed in our policy views if uh, we get caught, if he's against it, then I'm for it. We've been talking about NAFTA and its problems since it was signed, and we shouldn't abandon that now. And we should know that others uh, have raised this not only from the populist right, but from the left perspective uh, throughout Europe uh, and, of course, in the United States under Bernie Sanders. So again, uh, important work to be done. I think there's a growing acceptance that there's a space now opening up to consider uh, other options and build new solutions. And when we're considering the future of auto trade under NAFTA, that's an essential point. So just to wrap clearly, Jeff's look at the clear facts has informed our debate, um, and I an incredible contribution now into the days and weeks ahead as this unfolds. I think for us, we have to see that there is in fact a problem. We have to get serious about using meaningful policy levers, and we have to address labor rights in Mexico and focus on the unbalanced trade uh, within North America, and of course, we talked about the 2.5% tariff. There must be a meaningful price of entry into North America. Otherwise, everything else we're talking about, there's no way to enforce it or make it real for the company. I think Canada could have a, a positive future. We have incredible workforce. Our members are very proud of the work they do, an incredible record of quality and productivity. Uh, we, there are incredible dangers that we face by rash and uninformed policy decisions. And having an important event like this evening uh, Jeff's paper and others working on these issues will see us through to making better decisions. So on that, I commend him for his work, and I'll stop right there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bill. Um, Hugo, I'm going to ask you to come back up to the stage. Uh, I'm sure you have an important uh, contribution or two to make this discussion tonight. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions, but this is mostly for the audience. We want to hear from you. Um, I will ask a few questions to give you time to find people in red t-shirts who I believe will be wielding microphones and giving you the opportunity to ask any of the people on the stage uh, a question or all of us a question or however you want to put it. And uh, don't forget, hashtag CG Live. Um, Jeff, if I was back in my newspaper days, I can sort of see the headline, famous economist wants car prices to rise. I, is that the bottom line of your remarks? Is that, the, is that what has to happen here to, uh, to, to, to save the Canadian industry, is to essentially mimic what we do in dairy, mimic what we do in, in, in eggs and poultry, uh, control production, forcing prices to rise, and uh, therefore making, I guess, the, the Canadian consumer sort of shoulder 
uh, some of the responsibility of, uh, of keeping Bill's members in, in employment. No question that that's been part of the equation and that's part of the allure of globalization, not just in autos, but in everything. I mean, you can pretty well buy anything cheaper if it's made in a low wage market. You know, what we found was the paradox or irony of American workers shopping themselves out of a job at Walmart because the more they bought at Walmart, the more they displaced their own production. And, you know, certainly it's been an impact. That's been part of the quid pro quo, not just higher profit margins for auto parts and assemblers, but also lower vehicle prices. Now, maybe not as dramatic as you might think, because 40 to 45% of the cost, selling cost of a car is the cost of marketing and sales. Like when you see Matthew McConaughey slipping behind a Lincoln Navigator, that's not free, okay? <laughs> Somebody's paying for that. Uh, and so sales and marketing as I say, is 40 to 45% of final selling price. And that's determined by where the car is sold, not where the car is produced. But I think, you know, the numbers I've seen have pointed to like maybe $1,500 on an average vehicle of say 40,000. So that would be a two to 3% rise in vehicle prices. And there's no question about that. So that's part of the trade-off that we're making here. We're trying to regain production, employment, and investment, and we're gonna see car prices higher and profit margins lower. And again, it's the question of balance, okay? I mean, you know, nobody wants to see GM and Chrysler in bankruptcy. I think Bill would agree with me on that. But no one wants to see the price of their solvency be a hollowed out auto industry in Canada and the US. So it's trying to find that balance. The auto pack had that balance. Now, the auto pack was you know, not kosher by today's trade rules. The WTO ruled it illegal. I'm not sure that Donald Trump cares that much about what the WTO thinks, but at the end of the day, you know, what we're saying is to gain that balance back, you know, slightly higher vehicle prices, slightly lower margins, but more investment, employment, and production in our country is sort of, I think, where the new consensus will emerge. Okay, um, Bill, uh Jeff um, articulated uh, well in his pr presentation how, I mean, you articulated well the argument that this is a wage arbitrage issue. Uh, you mentioned that as well. Um, given this is about wages, uh, explain in more detail the, the union's thinking in choosing now to, to strike in Ingersoll. It would, uh, it seems to me, I'm gonna assume, I, I shouldn't speak for the audience, I'm gonna assume there might be a couple of other people like me who are, are puzzled over why, given the uncertainty around the auto industry and certainly Canada's uh, precarious state in what's going on, uh, why you would choose this moment to, to strike, as you said, after uh, for the, or for the first time in a generation? Excellent question. I mean, you know, sometimes the, the timing is, is just a happenstance. I, I, that may be part of it in this situation. Uh, I think very rarely we would say workers don't always choose to go on strike. They're kind of put in that position. Um, uh, and I, I think to some extent, the, the people had seen the writing on the wall. <coughs> they had just, you know, you imagine the experience, right? Uh, working in a high-speed manufacturing facility where you're working overtime Saturdays, it's demanding, it's tough. Um, and the companies are very sophisticated and correct in wanting people to hit metrics on quality and productivity, and they had done it. Every benchmark you could imagine and they were just rewarded by losing 600 jobs, um, which was painful enough. Uh, but then when they look down the horizon and were watching the production plans of General Motors as much as they can be ascertained, um, it becomes, well, we're not gonna have this power later. 
uh, if they move more and more production down the line. Um, and I think people were frustrated and, and fed up. So um, it could have happened a year ago. It could happen next year. It so happened that the collective agreement coincided at this moment with the NAFTA talks unveiling. So, um, you know, likelihood of this exact same dynamic playing out last year or next year, pretty high. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, throughout this discussion, I was thinking back to the stories of, of the Battle of the Alamo, and uh, that's another moment of North American history, and they were pretty frustrated at the Alamo, and they got run over by the Mexican army. I mean, is this in some ways a last stand for, for the Union in Canada? I mean, what, I mean, in the, the, the follow-up, of course, is it, what uh, makes you think that given all this happening and not just in, in North America, but Asia and, and elsewhere, I, why would, um, would a company respond to a striking union in Canada with, uh, okay, we'll commit for another decade. Why wouldn't the response or the automatic response would be fine? We get the message, we're going to Mexico or Asia or wherever else. Sure, uh, those, those are certainly uh, um, points of view that are out there in the discussion. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, again, um, it's fairly normal standard course in the collective agreement and the collective bargaining to secure your future production and your footprint uh, ask the company to commit to vehicles and volumes going forward. This has been done in, in the main auto negotiations last summer uh, in Canada and in the United States. So that's a, a fairly um, kind of a standard thing. So to be out on strike over such a thing in an award-winning plant, it, it's even a little bit more shocking. Um, and then in terms of, you know, I, I don't think it would be a last stance. I think what we're seeing, not only by this kind of event, but the political winds are changing, um, and there's a growing recognition from people that are traditionally conservative and people who are traditionally uh, on the left of the spectrum um, that the certain model of global trade is broken, and there seems to be a, a, a reality and policy gap that some parties have picked up on. Um, and, and so, you know, now is a great time to make making this sort of argument. Uh, it's, I prefer not to be, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, in terms of having a receptive ear and for, for people having a hard look at the facts, like Jeff has pointed out, or people who have lived that experience, now is a, a serious time to, to take a look at where we go with global trade. So for those are some of the reasons why I, I, I think the members have strong support as well. Hugo, to you for a couple of questions. I, I think before we carry on with this discussion much longer, uh, it'd be good to get a perspective about what one of these plants means to Mexico. I mean, it's, uh, if not the primary reason for NAFTA in the per first place, there was certainly a, an understanding that, or a, a feeling among the US and Canada that it'd be good for the neighborhood um, if there was a, an opportunity to integrate the Mexican economy into the North American economy, raise uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, that sort of thing. Uh, what, what, when GM, Ford, any of these country, uh, companies go to Mexico, what does that mean for the, for the community, the, the, the country? What has what the impact been from your perspective? Well, GM and Ford, for instance, they did not go to Mexico on account of the NAFTA. G, uh, I think Ford was probably one of the, uh, uh, in the modern area, one of the first uh, uh, investors that was there since uh, the late 1920s, early 1930s. At one point, it's no longer the case, but GM was uh, uh, actually not long before the NAFTA negotiations got started. GM was the, the main employer in Mexico. So this is before the NAFTA. Now it is uh, Walmart. Um, <clears throat> but the NAFTA was seen, and this, this was uh, you know, one of the purposes, one of the main objectives that uh, Mexico negotiated the NAFTA. Uh, it was seen as uh, a tool, a development tool, and one would that help cement the more broader economic policies, uh, admittedly free market and free competition uh, policies in the 1990s. And to that extent, it has been a great uh, success. Now, uh, it, it, it is true that uh, wages in Mexico are 
uh, are lower. But uh, I think that if you look at developing countries, that is a truism. Wages in the developing world will be lower than uh, wages in the developed world. And they are not fixed either by tariffs or by uh, international trade agreements. If uh, Mexico could sign an agreement that uh, uh, after once it uh, entered into force, wages would be as high as uh, those that are paid in Switzerland, certainly uh, everybody would be uh, uh, for that. But the economics are not there. Now, the living standards in Mexico has certainly, have certainly increased. Even though wages are lower, the best paid wages uh, are those that are related to the foreign trade sector at large, uh, so foreign trade and foreign investment. Um, the, 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 the more skilled workers ha are, are now, as you saw in the video, in the auto industry and other foreign trade and foreign investment uh, industries. And assuming that uh, that, you know, I'll, I'll pick up on uh, uh, Jeff's uh, uh, first book title, uh, the world is uh, becoming smaller. It is better connected. And assuming that uh, just slapping high tariffs on Mexico will bring the jobs back, I think it's assuming too much. It's assuming that the, the, the jobs and investments won't flow to other uh, places in the world, Latin America, in Central America, in South America, or in Asia, as you pointed out, uh, that have uh, lower wages. It is assuming that, uh, you know, President Trump has said America first. It has not said America and Canada, we're in this together. Uh, it is assuming that uh, President Trump will be friendly to Canada. And I think it is assuming that anti-competitive practices, uh, that less competition and managed trade is actually the solution. And uh, I, I don't have the numbers with me, but I, it seems to me that it would not be, you know, slight increases in prices. Uh, prices today generally are much lower simply because, again, the world is more interconnected and there is freer competition than they were back in the auto pack days. So I think it is assuming, uh, uh, it, it is assuming too many things. Now, I don't disagree that Mexico and many other countries have very serious problems that need to be tackled. I don't disagree with the, uh, the corruption problem. I think that is probably Mexico's largest uh, problem today. I don't disagree that there is, uh, there, uh, uh, let, let me uh, put it uh, in context, when the minimum wage uh, is referred to, I think uh, Jeff said 60, or Jeff or Bill, 65 cents. That is more of an index than it is a real wage that is being paid. And what that, don't get me wrong, what that means is that there are certainly wages above that minimum wage that are paid, but many people don't earn even that minimum wage. Me Mexico has a, a huge poverty problem. Now, is the way to, to tackle that uh, uh, less trade and less openness the world around, or, or uh, are there, should we be looking at other solutions? Um, I'm going to make another call for people to find the, uh, the, the excellent people here in red t-shirts. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to make them ask some, but... Uh, uh. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I hope I don't sound too convoluted. Uh, could I get you to identify yourself, please? I'm sorry, I'm sensitive. Too many people with Bugs Bunny avatars call me stupid on, inter on social media, so I like uh, to, to know I've who we're talking that. to. <laughs> Lynn Kay. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I don't want to sound too convoluted in my question, but I do want to talk about a couple of assumptions. Um, when we've heard so many of the claims that uh, free trade has been so good for Canada, I've noted that the people who have promoted this discussion are primarily the negotiators of the deal, and I don't think there's been much of a voice for people who opposed it. Um, I think that has meant that the discussion has really been confined to what the impact has, has been in terms of trade opportunities. But from my point of view, what's being created is an international constitution that trumps human rights. 
uh, because um, we, we're not seeing the wider impact. Uh, we're not seeing the impact on, it's creating new rights. For instance, the investor state provision is one that concerns me greatly as anti-democratic. It creates new rights for investors and shareholders, but not new rights for working people. So, and for people who are advocating for change in the environmental field. And we've seen in the cases that have pursued that, uh, that investor state provision that we've had to uh, pull back policies related to the environment um, because of the potential, not just real loss of profit, profits by companies, but also their potential loss. So my question is really relating to um, how you practically negotiate uh, three things, local control, because um, this is removing, it's taking steps very far away from local control of, on ma many policy issues. Um, secondly, the protection of human rights. And third, we can't presume that the industry will stay the same. There are going to be massive changes with technological developments. And we need to know how the local and the international uh, relate on that issue and how we can protect all the aspects of life, not just a very narrow um, advancement of a trade opportunity. Um, okay, excellent articulation of a, of a concern. I think that's uh, out there by many people. Jeff, um, your thoughts on that? But Hugo, sure. too, since you're the actual uh, former negotiator, um, maybe you can I'll give you a minute to articulate or think about what you might want to say to some of those questions. Uh, maybe why they, these things weren't better addressed the first time around, uh, whether you think there's much hope of them being addressed this time. But Jeff, to the, to the global issue. Sure, uh, I think it goes to the heart of many people's concerns about ever greater globalization, and that's the loss of national autonomy, because in this sort of rules-based trading system, you know, these rules often impinge on all kinds of policies, not just labor, environmental policies, that all of a sudden are ruled to be, you know, not compatible with the World Trading Organization. And what it effectively means is a loss of sovereignty in jurisdictions that would otherwise be under national purview. You know, and I guess, you know, you talk about investor rights versus labor rights. Here's the big difference, you know, capital's mobile, labor's not. And that creates its own challenges, but I think that you know, it speaks to the heart of why we are seeing pushback against globalization. And I don't think it's just like, you know, a black sheep event, Donald Trump. Like, I think this is bigger than Donald Trump. Bernie Sanders, of course, from the opposite end of the political spectrum, but all across the OECD is, you know, this, you know, we're, we're ceding sovereignty to some organization called the World Trade Organization, where there's a governance gap between their, their decisions and their accountability to the electorate. So this goes far beyond NAFTA. I think that this is an endemic problem that further globalization faces. Hugo, so um, your take on this, why did you guys turn the world over to the, uh, the corporations uh, 20 years ago and, and allow them to crush human rights? <laughs> no, actually, the, the, the circumstances there then were, were different, and uh, um, <clears throat> things have greatly changed. And, you know, when the NAFTA was negotiated, uh, um, labor and even the environment was not at the forefront of anybody's mind. Uh, we did not have such a big environmental problem as we do today, and the concerns were, were different. Uh, the same thing with respect to labor. When the NAFTA came around, uh, it is true that the NAFTA centered around trade. Now, trade agreements are neither the, the cause nor the solution to every single problem. And I do agree that there has to be a lot more work on the human rights area on the labor side, and today, 
uh, probably one of the most pressing issues is, is environmental protection. But if you look at the, uh, the NAFTA and the NAFTA side agreements, the, na the, the labor and environmental protection uh, agreements, there are much, they are much less about environmental and labor protection than they are about the ability to impose trade sanctions allegedly for labor or environmental uh, uh, violations. Now, Mexico was for negotiating labor protections, but the U.S. was not so keen on that. It was more uh, about, again, being able to trade, to, to take trade sanctions for uh, certain labor uh, breaches and negotiating better labor protections. And the same thing can be said uh, about human rights. Now, uh, should we focus on these issues as uh, the, the, the trade talks go forward? I, I think we should, but I don't see that happening. There is a lot of talk about bringing the side agreements into the main uh, agreement, but it's still not about environment and labor protection. It's still about trade sanctions. So something in the equation is not correct. And I don't see, for instance, Canada and Mexico saying, uh, since we're negotiating everything, let's talk about Par the Paris Accord. Let's talk about climate change I within the trade talks in the NAFTA. Uh, I, I, but I do hear, no, let's bring the side agreements into the main agreement. I don't think that is a substantive change. And I agree, that is where we should be looking to. Any more questions out there at the moment? Sure, go ahead. Zero. Uh, Gordon Nichols from Kitchener. Uh, I've been around long enough to remember when Pearson brought in the Auto Pact and things at that point were working, I think, as far as Canada was concerned, quite favorably. I would like now to ask a question that pertains to numbers. Uh, Hugo mentioned that uh, overall um, trade had increased in North America by 300%, if I got the number correctly. One number that was not mentioned by any of you gentlemen was that Canada has lost somewhere between 400,000 and 450,000 jobs in the manufacturing sector in the last 20 years. So my general question is plain and simply this. Um, looking at this from the point of view of a Canadian, um, how do you explain to Canadians that that's a good deal? To get a 300% increase in overall trade, but lose 450,000 good paying employment jobs? Well, I guess I would say it isn't such a great deal. And, um, you know, I pointed out in my comments that while the economy's kicked out a lot of jobs and the unemployment rate is, I don't know, it's full employment, but it's pretty close to cyclical lows, um, the fact of the matter is that in the good sector of the economy, there hasn't been, not just manufacturing, the whole good sector of the economy, there hasn't been one net job created in the last 17 years. Okay. You know, I'm not going to blame that all on, <laughs> on NAFTA and Mexico, but I am saying it's not unrelated to globalization. And by the way, NAFTA is not the only free trade agreement we have. We have multiple bilateral free trade agreements. <laughs> So, yeah, and, and then you look at the service sector where all our jobs are. Like, yeah, I used to work in the service sector. You know, I was the chief economist of an investment bank, but unfortunately, that's not really indicative of what most service sector jobs are about. There hasn't been any real wage growth in the service sector in the last 15 years. So, you know, that's why people are getting left behind. And that's why, you know, Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, Vriex, it isn't an accident. It isn't a fluke. It's ultimately a political expression about how, how skewed the gains from free trade are. I mentioned in my remarks that, you know, I mean, ever since David Ricardo in the 19th century published the theory of comparative advantage, we know theoretically that free trade brings, you know, net welfare benefits that can make everybody better off. But the distribution of those benefits have become 
so skewed that many now challenge the legitimacy of the process. And in, you know, traditionally we thought, well, distribution's a side issue. It can be dealt after the fact. Well, distribution has become the issue. And if, you know, if we don't deal with it, then the pendulum's gonna swing. And, and you know, Hector said something that I would agree with. You know, Hector's saying, hey, you know, you slap the 35% duty on Mexico, they'll just import the cars from China or wherever. Well, you know, obviously they've got to slap the duty on more than Mexico to make that work. But I think if they went in that direction, Including they would. And Canada. then the question for Canada is, which side of the tariff wall do you want to be on? The inside or the outside? And obviously the inside's a better place than the outside. But in, in, back to this gentleman's point, I mean, that's precisely the question. I mean, is free trade compatible with creating high paying jobs and restoring the middle class? And it would appear that in Canada, and I don't think the difference would be a whole lot different in Ohio or Michigan, it's had the opposite effect. Bill, do you want to jump in? While you, while you address the, sure. the gentleman's question, could you also address uh, a, a larger point? Um, I think, you know, articulate for people why we're focusing on autos and, and the making of stuff that hurts when you drop it on your foot. I mean, we're in Waterloo. This is a town that seems to be doing or on the way to be doing extremely well based on all the construction and things that I see going going on here, but this is a, this is a services-based economy now. Uh, it's, a, it's a tech town. Uh, why do we still care so much about uh, making stuff? Sure, okay, well, let me, I'll do those in, just quickly in, in the way that, uh, the order they came. The, the question from the floor here about um, the volume of trade and squaring that against job loss, I mean, I think, without belaboring the point, the question is what are the right metrics? And there's such a, a fascinating uh, grab bag of evidence offered about why uh, this has been a success. And you need to pause for some obvious questions about, well, what's so great about trade flow in and of itself? In and of itself, does it do anything? Um, and sometimes it doesn't. And again, in the auto sector, we've seen some reports talking about surging exports of parts from Canada to Mexico. But what in effect that means in a micro example is we're exporting parts for final assembly for the highest value added production in Mexico rather than here. So on one balance sheet, you can show the surging exports and rising levels of trade. But the consequence of that in this micro example uh, is negative for the Canadian industry. So I think the question is, is when we're evaluating uh, the trade, we need to look at real metrics across the board, like Jeff has done, and others would add in other elements around the environment, human rights, and other matters. So again, an excellent question. On why we're so worried about stuff, um, that's an excellent question. Um, I, a couple of ways to answer that. One, of course, is that stuff still matters. Stuff still matters tremendously. Um, for advanced industrial economies. I think people have realized, you know, we like to focus on the high end of the service economy, tech and so-called new economy, uh, but an awful lot of service jobs are not that. They're not the chief economist at the bank. <laughs> They're serving coffee or something else. Um, and so, you know, we, for the most successful economies still have an advanced base of manufacturing, whether that's in Germany and Scandinavia, uh, the advanced economies uh, in Asia, uh, and it's why many of the developing nations, what is their target? What do they want? Why does China want to build aircraft and cars? Why does Mexico want to attract advanced manufacturing? Because the spin-off benefits and the applications of technology are still incredibly important. I also think uh, when we think about regulating services uh, and thinking about trade and services, that's a, that's a really fascinating question. Perhaps one way to think about it is the same sorts of conditions that attract the benefits of service work, um, where do they land? And what are the social conditions and economic conditions that are going to land those in the UK versus Canada, or perhaps in, you know, in, in Bangalore, um, or other places where we see migration of jobs through the ability to use the internet and other things to, to have radiologists examine your x-rays halfway around the world. Um, the same dynamic of measuring and considering, well, 
well, what are the social and economic conditions that are allowing that and, and fostering that? Is it necessarily a good thing? I think those questions should apply equally to what we do around services, but it gets complicated to, to uh, measure things that are hard to measure, like okay. services, so it's okay. a bit of a long answer. Um, we're nearing the allotted time, but I don't have any particular issue in letting it run a little long. If there are some more questions uh, from the audience, uh, red t-shirts, do you have any? Sure, over here. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Stewart. I'm a member of the local chapter of the Council of Canadians, and I have a purely national question to ask. And that really around, that's really around uh, these negotiations for NAFTA, and as we drive towards supporting the uh, Canadian auto sector, I'm really concerned about what the consequences of that will be in terms of additional sacrifices that we'll have to do with respect to side agreements, et cetera, and particularly what's going to happen with the Canadian health care system because we know that the Americans are very eager to negotiate that away as part of NAFTA. So I'd like to hear your comments with respect to not having that sacrificed and particularly the advantage that the Canadian healthcare system provides to our Canadian auto sector. Thank you. Um, I'd like, why don't all three of you take that one sort of as quickly as you can so we can squeeze in as, uh, as many questions as, as we can in a few minutes. Um, uh, Hugo, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, it, Canadian healthcare system, is that was that part of the negotiations back in the day? Do you, do you, do you imagine that it's uh, part of the negotiations now? Uh, no, it was not. The health care uh, system in any of the countries was not part. It's really not a trade issue, but, but uh, they were expressly excluded. So it was not negotiated, and my understanding is that the Americans want to do away with their current uh, health care uh, uh, system or, or, you know, Obamacare, uh, but that would not have that would not need to have an impact either on Canada's or Mexico's or anybody else's uh, uh, healthcare system. So it is not, it was not a, a, a matter that was negotiated uh, back in the, uh, in, in the 1990s. And as far as I know, it is not uh, one that is currently being negotiated in the current talks. Bill, where, how does the Canadian healthcare system fit in this, this sort of the competitiveness story? Is, it, is that part of the equation still? Absolutely. I mean, you know, again, it's a wonderful, uh, perfect uh, science experiment taking a look at uh, auto workers in the United States and Canada. Um, and uh, despite pressure to reduce the package on uh, benefits for American workers through their private system, uh, still somewhere in the range of about $15 an hour of labor costs of the total cost package is for around healthcare. Uh, in Canada, it's, it's about three or four dollars an hour for all the costs. So again, in a, somewhere in the range, eight to ten dollar advantage in total labor cost in Canada, owing from the fact that we have a universal public health system for probably an equivalent set of, of, uh, of uh, health benefits. So again, an important uh, factor, and I think something that speaks in favor of Canadian manufacturing and service pr uh, work as well. The only other thing I'd say, I would agree certainly with, uh, with my colleague here that uh, uh, healthcare doesn't appear to be on the radar at the moment uh, in these talks, uh, but it is a good example of the kind of investor state uh, rights that could be under certain types of free trade agreements uh, brought in a challenge and challenge policy making. Um, not at the moment as I see it and under this current round of discussions, but it, it, it is certainly something uh, that can feature into other trade agreements. Jeff, quickly, you're... Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, it was one about. of the advantages that we had here. We had two advantages. Uh, we had the Canada-US exchange rate for most of the period of the time. The Canadian dollar trades at a discount to the US, and I'm sure Unifor was able to arbitrage that in the collective bargaining process. And the other advantage, of course, was that we had public health care where in the U.S. GM and Ford would have to uh, buy private plans. As far as the challenge, I don't know. I, I see that somewhat different. I see this as an opportunity for a reprieve. Whether there is a reprieve or not, we'll see. I think that under the existing NAFTA arrangements, we could say with great certainty 
that the Canadian industry could look forward to a very significant downsizing in the future. So, you know, perhaps this isn't quite the calamity that people initially suspect. It may give us an opportunity to rebalance things when otherwise there would not. Um, I'll squeeze, I'll do one more question if there's one out there. Um, John Peters, I'll, I guess I, I had three questions. So well, ask I'll all try. three then. I'll, I'll, I'll just go down. Our lucky day. <laughs> Our lucky day. Um, thanks very much to both Jeff and, and to Bill for the presentations. I thought they were great and I think they really show the consequences of what we've seen from NAFTA, especially in terms of manufacturing, but also in terms of income inequality, in terms of job quality, uh, and in terms of the real uh, socioeconomic cost that we've seen for the most workers in North America. But in terms of the solutions, then, you've mentioned that there seems to be, it's a bit of a governance gap uh, between, say, the WTO or in terms of the rules and how they're written out. But if your analysis is right, isn't it really more a democracy gap? Isn't it really more that the fact that both big corporations and large finance have been the ones who both wrote the rules in the first place, benefited from the rules, and are looking to revise those rules again to their benefit at the cost of the rest of Canadian citizens, and that it's not necessarily about changing the governance, but changing the democracy so that those corporations really, and finance, can continue to write those rules in one way or another. That's my first question. The second question then has to do about policy. You said this is about a trade issue and about a trade policy, but Jeff, you've written very eloquently that, that it's not about just trade these days, it's about the fact that we have a climate crisis we have an oil crisis and that we need a new sustainable economy. To do that then, doesn't that require that we have different kinds of public policies and it's not just about trade, we have different kinds of investment policies that we're going to need for new sustainable energies. We're going to need new transport policies if we're going to be able to deal with the climate crisis. We're going to need new kinds of tax policy if we're going to be able to control uh, the nature of corporations and actually redistribute fairly and create the kinds of infrastructure and the kinds of energy structure that we're going to need in the future. So I guess those are the two big issues. What kinds of policies do we have and what kind of democracy do we have? And to me, you've kind of skirted around some of those issues, but I'd like to hear a little bit more. Um, okay, Hugo, I'm going to give the democracy gap question to you. I, I thought you and some of your colleagues wrote uh, NAFTA, but apparently the big corporations did, so I'll let you take that one. Um, and then we'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Bill and Jeff talk to, take this beyond just NAFTA, beyond trade agreements and, and, and talk about maybe the, the, the wider array of policies that might be needed to address what we're dealing with today. No, I would disagree that uh, these agreements are written by the uh, uh, big corporations. Uh, um, somebody that has always been in the mind, at, at least certainly uh, it was in, in the Mexican negotiator's mind, was the consumer. And these trade, uh, trade agreements, larger trade and greater competition, do tend to lower prices. Uh, and uh, uh, that is to the benefit of the consumer, and that, you know, those are part of the benefits that, that are, are spread out. Certainly, uh, corporations, they, they they, they profit from these agreements. And I don't think that that is wrong. Uh, that is what fosters uh, innovation to, to a large extent. Uh, and, and that is, in many ways, what, what, what makes uh, uh, the world go. Although I will agree with Jeff that uh, one of the major challenges that we have today and uh, one of the, the, the largest problems that we see is a distribution problem. The benefits. Uh, I don't think that there is disagreement that there are benefits that flow from these agreements. It's just today our problem is, is how those benefits are distributed. Yeah, yeah I think uh, Hugo makes a great point that if it was just about the corporation's bottom line, this wouldn't be happening because they wouldn't have a broad enough political support. Consumers have been the big beneficiaries, and not just in NAFTA and autos, but generally in globalization. And how does that affect you? Well, it's not just your ability to buy a car, a car or a toaster or a TV cheaper. It also means an absence of inflation. And you know, how the world has changed, because in my 20 years working for an investment bank, we were always concerned about the wage pressures on inflation and the central bank's response to that. 
and how the pendulum has shifted when the central bank goes, we don't see any wage growth, and we're going to raise interest rates, but inflation's 1.4 percent. Well, you know, the economy, that economy is very different. Like, our housing market really can thank globalization, because without globalization, we wouldn't have 1.4 percent inflation rates, and we wouldn't have 2 percent mortgage rates, and we wouldn't have today's housing market. So, you know, it's, it's more than just Magna's bottom line. There's been other beneficiaries, and, but, um, you know, there's also been a lot of casualties. And again, the distribution, like no one, no one is contesting David Ricardo's insight on comparative advantage. You know, the, the issue is, what Ricardo never talked about is how those gains are distributed. So that while, you know, in theory, there are net welfare gains, in practice, many, many have got poorer when Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage says that there's enough net welfare gains that they can be compensated, but they haven't been compensated. And ironically, as the world has gone to ever greater trade liberalization, concomitant with that, starting, I guess, with Reagan and Thatcher, there's been a dismantling of the social security net. So just as globalization creates a greater and greater need for those social security nets, in most OECD countries, those social security nets have been significantly reduced over the last couple of decades. Bill, a last uh, comment sure. uh, uh, it, to you, sure, a great, on, on this a great, point. Uh, a, a great conversation evolving here. I guess it becomes a question of whether or not you can have consumers, because consumers are actually workers who are spending their paycheck. So it's a little hard to make the distinction and figure out where the benefits are going. Um, but of course, that's open to debate. I suppose to the question and issues raised from the floor here about you know uh, what is what is in an agreement and what is not an agreement, um, uh, and uh, you know I, I think perhaps we we do need to have other kinds of discussions. But um, I think where you raised environmental, human rights, uh, other questions. I've been talking about labor rights. Why are they become trade issues, and why why do they have to fit in there? is how I heard some of that question. Um, and it's because the space for policy making uh, and uh, autonomy and to either make improvements or changes on those issues nationally and internationally gets winnowed and narrowed either directly by certain kinds of trade agreements that afford investors rights to either challenge policy making sovereignty in nations or by the very fact of. And by that I mean the fact of dramatically lower uh, environmental conditions or dramatically lower labor conditions, the very fact that those exist in a free trade arrangement just narrow the scope and potential um, for, for other countries and nations to make those policy changes. So um, it, it's, it's difficult to untangle them, and I don't think you can, and so I think, I guess, by that fact, I do think they do belong in these discussions um, because, because they have to be there. Thanks, Bill. Um, and thank you. I've let this conversation drift about 15 minutes longer than I was supposed to, so this, I'll, I'll say goodbye. This might be my last moderating session here at CG. <laughs> uh, um, but it's not the final word. The final word is, is, is with Hugo, who is going to wrap up the session. Well, thank you, uh, Kevin, and, and thank you to Bill and Jeff uh, for this very interesting uh, discussion. Um, let me just uh, finish by saying, last week I was at the World uh, Trade Organization Public Forum. In the opening session, uh, there, there were, it was a great panel, and uh, there, there's two people that I would like to refer to. First of all, uh, Madame Christine Lagarde, uh, the Director General of the International Monetary Fund, was there. And it was also, uh, uh, and, and, and also Paul Krugman, the Nobel Laureate, uh, was a participant. And some of the things that we have uh, discussed here today you know, are not new when they were raised at the WTO public forum. So, um, you know, there, there is a, a, a recently the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO produced a report. It was out in March this year, and it essentially uh, uh, centered on the problem, on the distribution problem that, that uh, we have talked 
about today. Uh, Christine Lagarde confirmed that international trade has been a driver for growth, innovation, and productivity, that it has increased living standards and improved uh, the income of people, and that it has contributed to redu reducing inequality across countries, so inequality between one country and, or, or an and another. But importantly, she said that um, uh, uh, international trade has not contributed to uh, reducing inequality within countries, so uh, to, to looking uh, within one or, or any one country specifically. And, and again, this is one of the major challenges that we face today. And Paul Krugman uh, agreed with her, and he said that open markets have are indeed a source of benefits for many countries, and uh, for many countries, uh, are, they are even uh, a matter of survival. And he referred to Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, would be, uh, he feared to imagine what Bangladesh would look like today uh, uh, without uh, its insertion into global trade. Um, he, uh, Krugman said that textbook economics never said that growth and in international trade would be painless, that there would be adjustment costs. But he did say, uh, he did refer to the distributional problems. And what he dis did say, and uh, I, I want to bring it back to our discussion today, that what everybody, and he said uh, leading economists, himself included, uh, underestimated was the magnitude of those distributional uh, problems. And uh, they, they, he said that uh, economists and uh, uh, politicians failed to see problems, uh, for instance, how uh, geographically concentrated many industries are, many towns and cities that depend on certain factories and plants being, uh, being there. So while, while doing analysis on the aggregate numbers and the equilibrium outcomes, uh, almost everybody had failed to, th to see uh, the impact that these distributional uh, the, the inequality has had on real people, on real communities. And again, that is the problem that we face today. How, uh, the, the, the numbers I think are correct. I, I certainly have no uh, reason to dispute the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO uh, statistics. But the, what we have to, to concentrate on today is on how to ensure that those benefits are more equitably distributed. Now, you, I may have hinted that I like uh, free competition, and uh, competing views really is what foster uh, innovation. There are discussion here. Uh, we hope that we'll, we'll, you will take away, in addition to Jeff's books and some of our publications, uh, the, 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 these ideas and, and help us uh, to, to, to think and, and uh, uh, figure out ways how to resolve these challenging problems today. So with that, I don't uh, want to close without uh, thanking uh, my CG colleagues for making this very interesting discussion happening, uh, for uh, Jeff, Kevin, and Bill from coming from out of town to, to Waterloo and, making, uh, and, and, and engaging in such a, a vibrant discussion. And, uh, and thank you all for being here tonight and uh, staying for a few extra minutes. I, I always think it is great when we have to spill over, not because we had a lot, the, the people on the panel had a lot of things to say, but actually because the audience wanted to engage uh, with us. So thank you all and good night.